I'm Lynn Fraser. I'm with the Kilby Center for Recovery, and I'm very happy to be talking today with Dr. Stephen Danziger. And he's involved with Refuge Recovery and has a lot of experience that I think everybody will enjoy hearing about. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Steve, and let you introduce yourself. Hello, everyone, and I'm really glad to be here. I'm glad to be able to share at length about all of these things that um, I'm passionate about, I'm working on, uh, all the my colleagues around me are working on, and um, this is a wonderful opportunity for us to maybe take a, a new step into a new future for recovery in general. Um, and just a little bit about myself, I'm a, a, a licensed MFT in California. I am, uh, I have a doctorate in clinical psychology. Uh, that doctorate, um, I focused on the role of spirituality in both the development of uh, the ideology of uh, complex post-traumatic stress disorder and also its treatment. So I've had that focus for a long time and um, my introduction to the world of addiction was through participating in it myself and uh, entered recovery 28 years ago. And a uh, few months, four months into my recovery, I was uh, brought to an AA retreat at a Zen Buddhist monastery. And I got my first uh, meditation instruction and I've just never stopped. So um, I've been on this uh, parallel and sometimes completely right in tune, uh, Buddhist path and uh, recovery path. And so uh, my first work that I did in sobriety was I was a high school English teacher in Brooklyn, New York. And there were race riots in the neighborhood where I was teaching uh, the summer after my first year of teaching. And I sort of dove into the aftermath of that and all these nonprofits came in and gave us all training on how to work with the students and work with each other around those issues. And I was fascinated and hooked for a million different reasons that maybe would be another conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, we really trial by fire. It was like, hello, welcome. Yeah. First, welcome, which I'm from, so I, I understood that part. But yeah, welcome to the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so anyway, I, I ended up uh, being part of a group that rewrote uh, the curriculum for New York City public schools around leadership, violence prevention, anger management, conflict resolution. This is after a year after those riots, uh, the Crown Heights riots. And so my introduction to uh, the world of helping really was around, first around sponsorship and 12 step, but then professionally through teaching and then a teaching around these issues that were really about now the way I frame it for myself is around institutionalized trauma. So I sort of learned that way. And then I moved to Los Angeles in 2002. And one of the first people that welcomed me here was an old friend from New York who happened to be the uh, running the outpatient at Promises uh, mm -hmm. in West LA. And she asked me to run a group. And I had never done anything like this. And I said, I'm, a, I'm not a therapist. And she said, that's OK. I need a life skills group. So you're an educator. Mm -hmm. so, uh, went into that and um, uh, that's it, you know, and I went back to school, you know, I was, I was reeled in. And then I think the other important point in terms of, you know, starting our discussion about where I'm coming from and what I might have to offer is um, my supervisor uh, for my MFT internship uh, was an EMDR therapist. And so, uh, and an addiction specialist. So she was already using EMDR in that context, um, maybe in a way that, well, is over 10 years ago. So, you know, there was less sort of being talked about, less known, and in a lot of ways she was doing cutting edge work in that way. Anyway, she brought me into that world and I was, I was completely, I, I said, oh, this is where the healing is. So I got trained and so at this point, I'm an uh, Andrea approved consultant. I'm a trainer with the Institute for Creative Mindfulness. I train EMDR therapists uh, here in California and beyond. Um, I've just, uh, I've got a book coming out with my colleague whose institute I train for about EMDR therapy and mindfulness 
mm -hmm. for trauma-focused care, which is a great deal of my passion, moving from trauma-informed care to trauma-focused care. Ah, now, can you go into that a little bit, what you mean by that? Absolutely. So uh, trauma-informed care is, it, it's a wonderful new standard of practice, and it comes from years of trauma theory and um, you know, just psychological theory, and also, you know, all the other elements that those of us who are, you know, in the know, you know, the spirit, the mind, body, spirit elements, you know, like um, one of the things that I like to think, the, the way I like to think is from a both and perspective rather than an either or perspective. Mm -hmm. And so trauma informed is basically setting up your agency or your practice or even your engagement with someone in a way that will uh, be the most potentially not triggering, you know, just for starters, you know, mm -hmm. not trigger someone, and then is uh, is educated and able to see and witness all the different ways that a, a trauma uh, affects uh, the person that's in front of me or the people that are in front of me at the agency, and it really has become a standard of care in as much as SAMHSA. Uh, put out guidelines, and I think they're actually excellent guidelines around this in 2014. Again, this is all so new, right? So new, yeah. And, um, you know, and as it applies to addiction treatment, you know, we've been talking about this in the field ever since I've been in it. You know, we talk about trauma, its effects, and, and what we might need to do about it. And so we've been informing ourselves for a long time, you know, a lot of us in the field. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the sort of the consensus seems to me to be that if you don't treat the trauma, you won't treat the addiction fully. Right. And that the issue really is the trauma. Mm -hmm. And that we're also working, this is working from a model of um, Pierre Genet, 1889, first described a three stage um, model of trauma treatment. Mm -hmm. And he was very uh, committed to the idea that trauma or post traumatic stress. Uh, was implicated in most neuroses. And Freud kind of agreed with him at the beginning and then went off in his world. Mm -hmm. um, and Janae is who, Bessel van der Kolk, you know, Gabo Mate, all the people who are talking about trauma now, that's who they picked up on. And, and, and really Francine Shapiro with EMDR, Peter Levine with Somatic Experiencing, everyone is putting forth this model of how to treat people. Mm -hmm. So, a lot of what it is is trauma focused care in the larger mental health perspective is is okay everyone is saying or not everyone it seems many people are saying that we need to focus on the trauma treat the trauma and then the rest of the diagnoses or the rest of the disorders or take those words out of it the rest of the dilemmas the problems will be revealed and healed and so let's do that. So the question just becomes, you know, how to do that. So right. uh, there's a number of people who have wonderful, you know, I've just mentioned a few people who have proposed many uh, different structures. Mm -hmm. And so what I've come to from my years of Buddhist practice, my years of doing EMDR, my years of doing EMDR therapy in a treatment context, um, is that I sort of pulled back and took a 30,000 foot view and saw that you could use the eight phase protocol of EMDR therapy to run the agency, to provide the context and the structure. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, one center might be a medical model, another center might be a 12 step model, and that doesn't uh, take the other interventions out of the picture, it just makes that the core structure. Mm -hmm. So trauma focused is a way of saying that um, everyone who comes in to refuge recovery at this point and a couple of other, other centers I'm working with on implementing this kind of structure, they come in and they're immediately seen as a trauma focused therapy client. The language uh, in EMDR therapy used to be, are they appropriate or not appropriate for EMDR? I'm coming from the belief that everyone is appropriate. It's just that it's gonna take different people different lengths of time to get to the reprocessing. 
the reprocessing being what people picture and think about when they hear EMDR, mm -hmm. you know, they're think of the worst thing in the world and someone's gonna wave their finger at me. So that is some of the phases of EMDR. It's actually one of the stages or two of the stages of EMDR therapy, mm -hmm. um, that three-stage model. So the idea is that our goal becomes trauma resolution. Right. Adaptive resolution of post-traumatic stress, both related or not related to their addiction. And that by going in that focus, which I feel like I have a lot of backup for, mm -hmm. uh, the research and also in some of the thought leaders that you've invited, you know, that, you know, that that is the best direction going right. forward. And, um, and then the mindfulness piece is, you know, sort of all through it. Mm -hmm. uh, but in a lot of ways, uh, it's proposed as the best practice for that first phase of stabilization and preparation mm -hmm. for the possibility of the trauma resolution. Right. Uh, so that's why, you know, at Refuge Recovery, they come in and immediately they're meditating. Um, you know, at least pretty much anywhere from, a, not at all at once, but, you know, anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half a day, you know. And so, um, you know, obviously we put a lot of other structures in place to support that. And we're also coming at it from uh, using evidence-based approaches and mm -hmm. from using, um, uh, the wisdom of Buddhist psychology, which um, right. is quite wise. So I know that was a lot of words in answer to your question, but that might be the way this goes. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. That's very much the approach of the Killaby Center as well, to treat the trauma first and then the addictions, I mean, if we don't have to escape from something, if we're able to be present with it, we don't have such a need to get away. So mm -hmm. it makes it easier to work with the addiction. Well, I, I, went, I went through my experience, you know, going to that meditation retreat at the, the AA retreat at the monastery. It was actually a, the retreat um, theme was the promises. Mm -hmm. So I'm there, like we're talking about the promises of the 12 steps and of AA. And then I get my first meditation lesson. And I'm like, why does my brain feel different? Like why, what, what's this focus that I was able to maintain for about 3.7 seconds, but it was pretty remarkable to me. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. Um, and then I just, my curiosity got me and I just kept on sort of going into that. And what I've noticed is over time that sometimes just, you know, that sort of a practice does a lot of the work for me. Right. And um, again, for, for the principle being that, you know, for, for, for me, the main uh, goal of uh, a treatment center is gonna be stabilization and preparation for a sober life. You know, mm -hmm. the whole thing is not gonna happen at the center. Uh, many elements of the future work that the person is going to do are going to happen at the center for some mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Our main job is to stop the madness right. and then start the skill building for the new life mm -hmm. and, you know, perhaps point, help the person point themselves towards some meaning and some goals and all those things that support a, a good life and support recovery. And, and, so if that's what we're trying to do, then let's use all the, the best notions around what, it, what trauma means and what mindfulness means in establishing that. The other thing that really um, struck me from my early recovery um, and then was sort of a little sort of exclamation point was put on it recently um, was just how much the Buddhist psychology and mindfulness practice and just all those teachings re reminded me of um, what I was experiencing the 12 steps in the writings and in the meetings where I was meeting the people who were sort of seemed to be on the same path as me. Um, those of us who got sober in New York City in 1989 we're all like that was a special time you know which I think a lot of people feel about their town and their you know, right, right. you know, the gang that they got sober with. Yeah. Um, but there were a lot of people kind of starting to explore, you know, um, these alternative ways of, of looking at the spirituality. And 
and so recently, Regina Walker in the, on thefix.com uh, wrote an article called Bill W. and the Buddha. And in that article, uh, she unearthed, she did some research, and she unearthed a pamphlet from the early Akron group, um, you know, like in the 40s, mm -hmm. edited by Dr. Bob, who, I, you know, Bill was the one, let's have a seance, you know, let's take some acid, let's see what we can do here to <laughs> get spiritual. Yeah. And Dr. Bob basically found his Christian faith. I mean, that was his, that was, as far as I understand from reading the AA history literature, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, he edited this pamphlet, and in this pamphlet, it said something to the effect of, I might be paraphrasing a little, but um, uh, we have looked at the various spiritual traditions of, of the world, and the one that seems to most closely resemble our 12 steps is the Eightfold Path of the Buddha. Wow. In the 1940s in Akron with Dr. Bob in charge. Wow. And then he expands on it a little bit, and they, they, they say uh, something to the effect of, um, and this gave me a chill the first time, and I'll probably get a little chill, it won't come over the video, but um, uh, these principles, or the, this path, um, and he lays out the Eightfold Path of the Buddha, could easily be a substitute for, or an addition to our 12 steps. Wow, so, that's really interesting how he found those parallels. Yeah. Mm. So, so when you talk about what you're doing at your center and kind of and what we're doing at Refuge Recovery, right. um, and what Noah and the others who Noah Levine and the others who uh, worked on the book Refuge Recovery and developed the alternative to 12-step program aspect of it, um, what they discovered was, you know, yeah, it's um, you know you can look at it from all the different ways. You can look at it, you know, all paths leading to one or you know, all spiritual. I used to call it 12 steps spirituality's greatest hits. You know, so it's all, it's all there. And at the same time, um, and again, this is maybe because now I've been trudging that path for 28 years, more than 28 years. Um, yeah, it just makes perfect sense to me. You know, the, the, and it's not just mindfulness, it's the eightfold path, which is a path of ethical mind. Uh, the, right. the program of action piece that we have in 12-step recovery is there in, in that program, in that path. So could you talk a little bit about, you know, the Refuge Recovery Centers is based on the Buddhist Eightfold Path, and 12-step, every, almost virtually everybody else is based on a 12-step model. Uh, the Kill Center isn't, but there's very few that are based on mindfulness and, and this so how would you see, or how would you talk about your program being different? What's fundamentally different about yours compared to other recovery centers? So um, first of all, if you, if you were interviewing other people who are a part of the Refuge Recovery Centers team, you might get different answers. Okay. You've come to the right place for the friendliest answer possible. In, okay. in as much as, you know, I was at an AA meeting like a couple of days ago. Like I'm still, I love, you know, that program. I love what it's done for the world. I love what it's done for me. We're not having this conversation without it. When I, when I teach about refuge recovery, the meta method, all the things that I'm working on, I have, I always talk about basically the turning point is I have a, a slide in my presentations, which is a picture of the Sieberling Gate Lodge, you know, where Bill and Bob had their first talk. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I went there, I actually, I made the pilgrimage. I was on my way to visit my colleague, Dr. Marich in, in Youngstown, which is where she lives. And so I went to Akron and I literally felt the energy from that conversation, you know, coming out of that building. Mm -hmm. It might be, I might've been projecting, but I, that's not how I feel about it. Right. Anyway, the point being that, that all of this started there. And what started there was connection between two people Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the beginning of the taking of action on behalf of recovery. So, and then, you know, the AA itself and, and a myriad of programs that have come from it, amazing, beautiful, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, perfectly imperfect, right? Mm -hmm. So our program is not, you know, we're not 12-step uh, not, uh, haters. We're not anti-12-step. We're proposing that, uh, the sort of, not sort of, the, the structure of a center would be better served 
um, with a focus on developing uh, mindfulness practices, in our case, Buddhist mindfulness practices, mm -hmm. specifically, and getting trauma-focused treatment um, in your individual therapy, and then also from the perspective of the way the groups are laid out. I mean, the, the groups, in a lot, of, a lot of the groups don't look that much different than, than other centers. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, um, so the, the idea is like many of our clients, and I don't know what the future holds, you know, because Refuge Recovery is very new, the program, and our center is only a couple of years old. But I would say, you know, a majority of our clients work both a Refuge Recovery program and a 12-step program, mm -hmm. right? So it's not, uh, they're not, it's, it's both and. So I would say that the difference is, the, the big difference is we don't do any, you know, we don't do any step work. We don't have them doing steps, but we do have them doing some work that is outlined in the Refuge Recovery Book because it's not just simply the Eightfold Path here, work it. It's here's the Eightfold Path translated into a recovery program right. um, that can help you. Mm -hmm. um, and then also there's, to my mind, and, you know, this is actually, this is, become harder for me to say because I'm, I'm waiting for the haters to come and, you know, start yelling at me about it. But, you know, like I said, I was at AA meeting the other day. AA, great program, fantastic. I don't know if it's necessarily treatment. In other words, the clinical, you know, on the clinical side, mm -hmm. um, you know, it is, to my mind, uh, it's a part of a picture for many people, right? And then, um, uh, and uh, I also believe that uh, giving folks the mindfulness skills that we're giving them and starting them on their tra trauma resolution path and not discouraging 12-step uh, at all. As a matter of fact, encouraging it for most of our clients because it's like, yeah, it, you know, uh, if you live in Los Angeles, you're coming to refuge. Um, we've got, you know, whatever, five to eight meetings a week in Los Angeles now. You know, but right. that, you know, and you don't have that many means even in some large cities. Right. Right. So if you're going home to Omaha, you know, and there's no refuge, you know, we'd be, we'd be remiss in telling you not to, you know, to pursue it. So it's more about, you know, I guess you could think of it from this Dr. Bob pamphlet perspective, you know, where more than other centers, uh, or, or different than other centers, we are using the Eightfold Path of the Buddha as a substitute for the 12 steps. And for those clients who are in 12-step programs, we're using it as an addition to. Right, right. So if, if we look at trauma as being at the root that needs to be dealt with first, um, isolation is certainly a part of most people's experience who have addiction and you know the 12 step meetings are so good for connecting with other people and they're so available which which does make it very valuable it's a very really solid piece of the whole 12 step movement that's for sure yeah absolutely i mean i'm i'm like, well, like i said the the two things that came from dr bob and bill talking were connection and action and the connection and the the idea of community and you know, in, in refuge recovery or in, in, in Buddhism and Buddhist psychology, uh, there are three jewels and the, the, the refuge, um, uh, I just pretended I had a t-shirt on with this, um, but the, the refuge uh, logo is the three jewels. And those three jewels are a Buddha, which uh, refers to the per, perhaps the Buddha nature in each of us. It's not the historical Buddha. It's not mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, Dharma, which is the teachings. And then Sangha, which is community. So community is one third, probably more mm -hmm. than that of the answer. So absolutely. I mean, the, the 12 steps, uh, 12 step programs have, have created that. Um, one thing that just came up for me though, that's uh, interesting uh, as we're talking about that is uh, my colleague, uh, Jamie Marich, who I've mentioned a few times. So her, my introduction to her was she wrote a book called Trauma and the 12 Steps. I've read that. It's an excellent book. Excellent book. And I, I looked at, I just looked at the title and I just stalked her by email. I just said, I need to know you. And she said, okay. <laughs> Scary. And so, um, and we've been friends and colleagues ever since. But um, 
that book, you know, is what we're talking about here. It's, it's right. how do we fine tune all of the wonderfulness that was created in the 1930s, right? right? Mm -hmm. You know, and some people would make the d different cases for different things. Like you've got to change the language of the book or you have to do this, you have to do that. To my mind, the, the greatest thing we need to do is the kinds of things that she outlined in that book, which right. is to make, uh, uh, help people you know, these uh, folks who are avocational helpers, you know, become more trauma-informed, trauma-sensitive. Um, look at the reality of, and again, this is totally anecdotal, but I think, you know, I, I can gather a room of 12-step people and probably get a decent consensus on this, is that so many people relapse on the precipice of the fourth step. And that's because they're going into, they're being encouraged to go into a trauma-filled world Right. without the proper support and it's not by virtue of like being mean or nefarious or you or even that badly informed i mean a lot of what we're talking about here we couldn't have this conversation let alone the computer connection you know we couldn't have this conversation 15 years ago 10 even 10 years ago right I'm having it quite this way so um so let's so yeah. go, let's go into that so one of the things that um i enjoyed about your book is that it it works with the helpers, the people who are, are the addiction workers working in centers, doing that kind of work in 12-step groups or whatever it is. And it would stand to reason that a lot of those people have addiction, at least in their past, some addiction recovery, so probably some trauma as well. And then you get the whole piece of, we need to feel safe enough to go in to do the trauma work. And then what you said near the beginning was that people come into the center and right away they're they're meditating for an hour an hour and a half and you mentioned some supports that are necessary for that so could you just kind of talk about that whole area like what is it that that gives people the confidence to know that they're going to be okay to actually go in and do the work around trauma hmm. so before we went online together here we we, we talked for a, a minute about you know, like that, where we let, let's talk about that which has been done right over the years, and right. that which we might want to either tune up or just you know take what's good and then add what's you know as good or better. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things that I have had happen consistently in the addiction treatment centers that I've worked at, regardless of how you know, what the success rate was, and that's another conversation, right? Like what designates success? Um, but the one thing that happened fairly consistently is that the clients said, I feel safe. Mm -hmm. And I've never felt that before. Right. So, so there's a number of, I think there's a number of factors. I think there's, there's first of all, training staff from top to bottom in, being safe people, right? Um, of of uh, understanding trauma enough so that they're not either triggering it or encouraging it or creating new trauma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what I've noticed is too that these folks who have said I I feel safe here, they tend to do pretty well. Like just that basic level of safety. So I think some of what we've tried to do is at Refuge in particular is to create enough training opportunities so that people across the board understand this model of these two models of the Eightfold Path, mm -hmm. you know, Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path as a guiding structure. And then also this structure of the three, stage, three stages of trauma treatment mm -hmm. and of uh, the eight phases of EMDR. So only our therapists need to know how to do EMDR and to do that in the room with the person. But if our other staff know that, oh, you know, they just went through an EMDR session, so they might be a little bit wonky, you know, right? right? So, mm -hmm. you know, let's keep an extra eye. Let's not, let's definitely not open it back up, right? Like, mm -hmm. don't. Go pry. Hey, so how was that EMDR session? You know, what trauma did you talk about? Want to tell me about your trauma, right? Like, don't open it back up. Um, uh, the meditation practices 
that they're introduced to at the very beginning. Uh, when I was doing my research before uh, we launched Refuge Recovery as a center, I saw there was one center in Switzerland where Vipassana meditation, insight meditation is the core of their program. And they do, at least what I read, I haven't talked to them, but what I read was that for the first year, they only do breath meditation. So um, here's the thing is that the breath is not necessarily a safe and okay place for everybody. Right, so, especially with trauma. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, so um, part of the support is we're not one size fits all in our approach to it. Mm -hmm. We make sure that we're watching and listening for people's abilities or lack of abilities to go to certain places and finding the practices that are going to support them. Mm -hmm. And really thinking strongly and always about what in this early time are we able to do to start to create some positive neural networks, some resources, some ability. Uh, one of my favorite things that I heard um, from a Buddhist teacher once was, you know, uh, find, let's find a place in your body that isn't anxious. Is your elbow anxious? <laughs> Focus on your elbow then, right? Yeah, right? Finding creative ways to create layers of, you know, building layers of safety and ground for that person. Because right. trauma treatment is not, see, the old thought on trauma treatment was like, you know, when, when people hear me say what I'm saying, oftentimes they'll think, oh, so they walk in and you're like, what's the worst thing that ever happened to you? Right, right. Follow my fingers. No, yeah. no, no. Right? And, and that is, and again, same thing, not nefarious, not, not even that ill-informed. Like, you know, it's only been the last 10 years that people have been considering uh, different ways of viewing addiction through the trauma lens. Mm -hmm. so, so now we're at a point where it's like, oh, you know, we're gonna take whatever time it takes to create that resilience mm -hmm. and also giving people even the smallest amount of mindfulness abilities in the beginning there makes them into better trauma reprocessors right. in MDR sessions, yeah. which Amy and I really I feel like we got into pretty good detail in the book because it's very, it's, it's very easy to imagine how mindfulness could help you with stabilization preparation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's some research behind it. Um, mm -hmm. And there's been some conference presentations about it, maybe even some writing about how mindfulness is implicated in the reprocessing process. Okay. So, so you know, we're, what we're doing is we're not just giving them skills to, uh, you know, sort of get through a tough time. They're at a party and everyone's drinking. Mm -hmm. We're also giving them the tools for when, okay, we both agree and, uh, at Refuge, we work as a team, actually, instead of the individual therapist being solely responsible for deciding when it might be a good time to shift from uh, stabilization and preparation to um, reprocessing, mm -hmm. it works together. Every supervisory meeting is about that. Um, so, so that, you know, uh, any one of these clients that might get to the point where they do feel that level of safety Mm -hmm. resourcedness, mm -hmm. um, resilience. They have enough positive material that they can access so that they can go into the, the darker places. Right, right. And our assumption is that may happen at our center mm -hmm. and it may need to wait till they're at a lower level of care, like, you know, lower level of care or mm -hmm. upon discharge, whatever it is, right. that but they've started the journey. And so right. our goal is to create the, um, create the um, referral opportunities so they can continue that kind of work. Right. So, so their vision of their recovery includes that. Uh, right, right. So, so that's a little bit about, so going back to the creating the safety. So it's in, providing them with the kinds of groups that, you know, provide that safety in addition to, you know, like mindfulness-based relapse prevention, mindfulness-based anger management, 
Um, mm -hmm. We don't do groups where it's like, tell us everything about everything. Right. Not, you know, EMDR therapy posits that all I need from you to do the trauma therapy are the newspaper headlines and let's work from there. Ah, right, right. So how does that work in terms of the staff feeling um, safe enough to be, oh, there's so much trauma that, that, we, that we're dealing with when we're working with someone. How does that, how do the staff stabilize and feel safe? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I detoured a little from your question. I apologize. Oh, so, um, it happens. It does. Um, <laughs> Um, so, so, uh, I'll start from the, from the clinical staff. So, because with the clinical staff, um, they are asked to not just read my book, but to read other books and do other study and to be hyper-focused on self-care. Uh. That, you know, um, that's another thing that Jamie and I address in our book is that if you're not taking care of yourself, how are you, you know, really, you're going to do trauma work with people, you know, you're right. not going to work out. Yeah. So, so we ask that self-care be a focus, but here's another, another thing. And, and I don't, I can't speak to somatic experiencing or brains, but any of the other trauma modalities, because that's not my specialty, but EMDR therapy is uh, designed actually in such a way that I find it to be a kinder, gentler, um, and more sustainable way of doing therapy for a therapist. You mm -hmm. know, that um, the way we structure a session, for instance, is the, you, if you're doing a reprocessing session, you only reprocess up until the last 10 minutes of the session. The last 10 minutes of the session is a no-fly zone for reprocessing. Right. To, we need to resource the person and get them back on the ground and quite frankly, resource ourselves and get back on the ground. We right. might not, we're not, we're not gonna go out of our way, like, can you hold on a second? I need to resource here. This was a rough <laughs> session for me. But, you know, stop the train of trauma. Right. Because yeah, yes, it does get, you know, I've heard some and seen and been through some crazy things with clients in EMDR sessions. But uh, what I'm saying is that, you know, I've been through some crazy things and then I resource, we resource mm -hmm. and they're ready to go back. So. In the end, it becomes more sustainable for me. And, and the other thing is, is that um, I, you know, for lack of a better way of saying it, I see people getting better. Right. I'm, 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 you know, right? So I had, I had a ther my therapist back in New York um, for years. Um, his name was Simon, which is the best name for a therapist ever, Simon Says. So Simon said um, the, a good therapist has a lot of ex-clients. So that's kind of the way that I, you know, with, with EMDR therapy and, and I'm noticing, and again, only been at this in this way for a couple of years at Refuge Recovery, where training all the therapists and having EMDR therapy be their primary therapy, mm -hmm. uh, pretty much unanimously, and I don't know if they're just trying to make me happy, but I don't think so, they're, they're saying, you know, yeah, I feel like I have more energy. Right. I'm able to go home and and go to my yoga class and have some dinner. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, I still have, you know, because of the level of compassion that helping professionals have, you know, that's still there, but it's not sucking them dry. Right. So, so that's at the clinic, on the clinical side, and then administratively and um, with techs and, and just the rest of the staff, same sort of pattern or, or message is that self-care comes first. One of, the, one of the things that we ask of our uh, of employees is that they go on retreat at least once or twice a year, right? To, to really engage with their own mindfulness practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just try to, you know, if, if, you're, if you're having a Buddhist center and you're working at a Buddhist center, you're just gonna be surrounded with the stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's not the 100% answers, you know, sitting meditation is not what we're saying, but the eightfold path, if you, you know, if you break it down, you know, there's the wisdom factors, the ethical factors, and the mindfulness factors. So That's encouraging right. staff to engage at all times with all three. 
which sounds like a real hard job, but it's not it actually makes everything easier. So this container really helps. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. One thing I thought was really interesting in, in your book was when you spoke about the value of, of meditation in the equilibrium in the mind. And I think it was when you were talking about attraction and aversion mm -hmm. and how so much of addiction is based on attraction towards some state we want and aversion trying to get away from something. Could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. You know, I don't know if you have, if you know people with this experience too, but you know, uh, you buy a Volvo and all of a sudden you see all the Volvos on the road, right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I got sober and like many people who got sober, I immediately thought everybody is an alcoholic or an addict, right? I just look around and you're all addicts, you know? Yeah. And um, yeah, which is very attractive. <laughs> In a friend, yeah. Yeah, I meet a lot of friends that way. But um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but the, the, the thing is, is that, you know, uh, the Four Noble Truths kind of say it. You know, the Four Noble Truths basically say we're all addicts. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know the first truth is life contains suffering. Uh, and the other translations for that word dukkha include, you know, life can often be unsatisfactory. Right. Um, life is like a, a wheel where the axle is off just this much. So it goes the thunk, the thunk, the thunk. Mm -hmm. And then uh, higher up on the chain, there's old age, sickness and death, right? And everything in between. Right. So then he's like, all right, this is true. And I, know, I can't argue with him. And then the second truth is the cause of all of that is attraction and aversion, right? Mm -hmm. Craving and aversion and clinging and unhealthy attachment. Since now we have Western psychology, we need to put unhealthy attachment right. you know, to, things, to places, to people, whatever. So, so really, you know, and this is not to then say everyone's an addict, but it is to say that those of us who develop or have or are born with or whatever, it doesn't matter have the problem of addiction to substances or processes or, you know, behaviors. Um, we just get more caught in that web in a very specific way. Mm -hmm. and then the third truth is what's the, you know, what's the solution? And the solution is, or what, what, what can happen with that? And you can actually end suffering. Oh, how can you end suffering? The causes and conditions you end the craving and the version, right? So uh, I've mentioned this in the book and I talk about it all the time is just this idea of Buddha as the, the best psychologist ever and that he had trouble utilizing the sort of metaphysical verbiage of the time to describe what had happened to him under the Bodhi tree in those eight days that enlightened him. Mm -hmm. And when he came up with the Four Noble Truths, he had basically turned to the science of the time the medicine of the time, Ayurveda. So first truth is a diagnosis. Second truth is the symptoms and causes. And then the third truth is the um, cure. You can right. cure. And then the fourth truth is the prescription of the Eightfold Path. Right. So, so, so yeah, so looking at it from that perspective, you then can also help people who are addicted I feel like this, you know, starts to um, reduce the stigma or to uh, help people to understand that they're just suffering, right, <laughs> on a continuum and that these practices and to sort of walk this path is a prescription to help them to reduce it, reduce it, reduce it. Now, you know, if they, and then if they really want to go for it, they can you know, go full on into, you know, discovering the possibilities of the enlightenment experience. Right. And, you know, dealer's choice. You know? Right. All, what I, I would just hope people, you know, killing themselves, harming themselves, you know, um, and, and then that great, everything else is gravy after that. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of clients that I've worked with and sponsees and, and just my own self, like I've noticed that a little bit of renunciation, abstinence goes a long way. Mm -hmm. Like clean thing, like the people who are like, you know, 30 days in and it's like, Oh wow. 
I look better, <laughs> you know, like I, you know, I'm eating food, you know, I'm doing all these things. And how much percentage of the recovery is that? It's a lot of it. So, so helping people to see themselves on that continuum and watch them, you know, that they don't have to achieve some sort of perfection that they can just right. you know, sort of transform this suffering born of their craving and aversion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I also, I like, you know what I like about this practice too is um, one of the things that I can't, I probably would need like hundreds of thousands of hands for fingers to count the times I've heard it of the people who either report why they relapsed or are preparing to relapse um, with any addiction is I'm bored. Right. Not, you know, my partner is making me mad. Not, you know, just I'm bored. So being able to uh, help people to see that in the category of aversion, right? I'm right. averse to not being constantly excited or high or whatever. Right. It's a very helpful framework for some people in early recovery. Yeah, and it takes a while for the brain and the body to settle. Well, that no matter what it is, if it's you know domestic abuse and then you leave the person, you're hooked on the adrenaline and the trauma of it and the crisis all the time. It takes a while just to, to rediscover your appetite for normal levels of sensory stimulation. Yeah. yeah. For some people, that's a long process and it involves a lot of hiccups. Mm -hmm. And I think that the more people are consistently being held, that's another thing I love about trauma therapy, and this is both from my own experience as the client and then also providing it and training people in it, is this idea of like, we're not in this march from phase one to phase, like, like with the steps, it's not step one, step one, 12, bang, we're done. Right. So being able to toggle back and forth, like if I'm, if I'm working with a skilled trauma therapist, you know, we're resourcing, resourcing. Oh, we're ready to go. Let's, let's reprocess. Reprocess, mm -hmm. let's say, hit like a really gnarly memory or relationship that I just hadn't noticed in our work doing the history before. Mm -hmm. can, we back, can we back up a, a minute? Can we resource again? Oh, yeah, let's back up. Right. Resource, let's prepare together. And some of that resourcing, this is another sort of... Um, I don't know. Actually, it might have been an earned sort of stereotype of EMDR therapy of it being very cold and clinical, you know, uh, in the worst sense of the word, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. like, I am your EMDR therapist, follow my finger, you know, like, like rapport has nothing, you know, like, right, and, right. and, and I have, um, you know, some of the therapists that I've worked with, they're like, um, uh, actually, we had a joke at refuge for a while. A couple of my um, therapists are, are trained, highly trained in um, narrative therapy. And every time they wanted to, they, they used narrative work in the sessions, they would like whisper to him, I used narrative, you know, I'm like, you can tell, you know, <laughs> but it's all integrative, right? And it's a yeah. matter of the central thing and what you're integrating into it, right? So that's right. all, we're just kind of flipping it over. EMDR is the central and we full narrative and I, internal family systems and all the other things that you might do. But anyway, so sometimes when people, um, come in, they need, a, they need a talk session. Right. I just need to talk to my therapist. Mm -hmm. And that to me is not the end of EMDR. That's where going back to, that's a resourcing session. Right. I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm still that in the relationship as mm -hmm. a therapist. So, um, mm -hmm. And what are your feelings about presence? in terms of the therapeutic relationship that's my favorite word <laughs> it's also tara brock's favorite word or at least the her favorite word as it relates to a lot i've been looking and you at and using a lot of her meditations lately mm -hmm. and so presence is you know same as the bill and bob connection and action thing presence is you know yeah. I, mean, I don't know if it's still going on in as much as these are the findings, but like for years, the finding was that the important aspect of therapy was not anything other than the relationship. 
In other words, like, no matter what the technique was, it was the relationship that was providing the healing. Uh, according we're to- We're circling to, back to safety again. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. so presence is all. And, and I guess that, you know, again, going back to as well, going back to, you know, why mindfulness practice? Why Buddhist psychology? I mean, it would seem to me that, I mean, you can use even, you can use Cabot Zinn's definition, probably paraphrased, of mindfulness, which is, you know, present moment awareness, uh, non judgmental present moment awareness, mm -hmm. right? which is presence. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, if, I'm, if I'm in the present moment and I'm aware, and I'm with as little judgment as possible is the way I like to teach it when I'm doing a guided meditation because mm -hmm. it really trigger a whole host of different traumas by saying with no judgment, <laughs> not really. Oh, I can't even do that. Things. That's right. I don't know how to do that. Oh, I suck at this. I quit. I'm running out. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, so yeah. So using that definition or even just looking at again, the April path and what it's designed to do, you know, create, you know, the, the, the last two factors of the path are mindfulness and concentration. Mm -hmm. and what's that about? Mm -hmm. you're, 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 you're endeavoring to become or get into presence, become presence, right. become present. Mm -hmm. so I think that's everything. And I, and I think that a mind a Buddhist mindfulness um, focus just creates that as a byproduct. You know? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, if there's somebody that's new to recovery or struggling in recovery or someone who's working with people who are in recovery, what do you feel are a couple of really important things for them to start with? So, I think that, uh, there's a couple things. One is go where it's warm. Trust your gut because that's something that you might not hear sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and um, honor yourself and your experience. And, and um, I'm trying to think, you know, like from this trauma focused perspective, you know, uh, the language that we use in EMDR therapy used to be big T trauma and little t trauma. Mm -hmm. And now it's trauma and adverse life events. Uh, mm -hmm. In other words, whatever your experience has been to the new person and to the person working with new people, you know, whatever your experience has been, it's valid and it had that effect on you. Right. And there's, there's no hierarchy here. There's just you and your experience and how it has affected the way that you relate to your mind, to your body, and to the world. So seeking out whatever opportunities you can for um, being able to go inside in a safe way with guidance, mm -hmm. um, doing whatever you can to acquire some of the basic wisdom that is out there um, whether it be Buddhist wisdom or 12 step wisdom or the wisdom of CBT, you know, whatever it is that speaks to you and, 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 oh, I could look at it this way. Um, and then seeking community and that going, that's going back to the go where it's warm. Like you have the right to choose your communities. You have the right to, um, uh, say that this is okay and this is not okay as you um, progress into your um, recovery. And I'll, I'll share this too, is the other thing that I love about EMDR therapy, and they're not the only ones who say it, but um, I, as the professional, I don't do anything. Your brain heals itself. Right. I am just a facilitator who has some skills and techniques and therapies and theories that seem to pan out mm -hmm. that all lead to your as the client um, uh, healing yourself um, trauma from the Greek means unhealed wound 
And so your brain heals itself much the way when you got an owie on the schoolyard um, and got that scrape and you did all of those things that you needed to do. You, you know, gave it air, you cleaned it, you gave it air. You know, and then what happened? It scabbed and scarred or didn't scar on its own. Right. So our psyche does the same. Our spirit does the same. Mm -hmm. so, so find spaces where people honor that. Right. Yeah, those are all very important. And then to quote the first person who gave me uh, my meditation lesson, mm -hmm. uh, my very first meditation lesson was, and this is early recovery, you know, stern Buddhist monk in robes, bald head, yeah. I'm sitting on the ground and he told us, he said, Zazen, which literally means sitting Zen, because that was the form of meditation. He said, Zazen, sit down, shut up, don't move. Ding. <laughs> so find the less traumatizing version. You know, this is 1989, so right, people right. have trauma informed Buddhist meditation instructions. But, you know, give it a try. Even if you are thinking, 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 or there's a three-ring circus going on in your mind, if you can just do, sit down with a bell going off at the end five minutes later, mm -hmm. if you can do that for five minutes a day, it's going to help you in your recovery. And finding a little bit of guidance, whether it's from books or people in how to sort of continue that and expand on that. It's more about the practice. Right. Five minutes a day is better than 30 minutes on Saturday and none the rest of the week. Right. That consistency. Yeah. Yeah. And then people get to know that it's okay. They're going to survive that five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's and it's not the same five it's minutes all the time. Yeah. It's not, what? it's not the same five minutes. It's different. No. Day to Every day time is different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, let's talk about how people could learn more and get a hold of you. So what are the websites, the book names? So the websites are refuge recovery centers, uh, plural, dot com mm -hmm. is for the rehab. Um, Dr. Danziger dot com, D-R-D-A-N-S-I-G-E-R dot com has everything I'm doing from the training to working with refuge to the books to everything else. Mm -hmm. And the book titles are uh, Clinical Dharma, A Path for Healers and Helpers. Mm -hmm. And that has been out since October of last year. And um, the one upcoming is EMDR Therapy and Mindfulness for Trauma-Focused Care, which will be out on Springer Publications uh, November of 2017. Cool. And are you doing that one with Dr. Marich as well? Yeah, that one is, that's already done and just, we're about to get our proofs back. Very exciting. Awesome. Um, but that, yeah, that's myself and Dr. Marich together. And her book you referred to was Trauma and the 12 Steps? Yes. Trauma and the 12 Steps um, is a wonderful book. And while we're talking about it, uh, she also wrote uh, EMDR Made Simple, mm -hmm. Trauma Made Simple, and um, dancing mindfulness, which is her program of uh, mindful movement, where uh, that facilitates and creates facilitators who then right, right. embodied mindfulness. Right. So is there anything that we missed that you'd like to say before we finish? Um, I think we covered it. I would say that um, I would love for us all to work together mm -hmm. in the recovery community, in the spirit of both and, mm -hmm. and working with all of the different best practices that we discover with each other and from each other, mm -hmm. and see if we can turn this uh, cruise ship around a little bit. And right. that it's a cruise ship, so it's going to take time to turn it around. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess, you know, I look at this as, you know, the uh, opioid epidemic is an expression of addiction as a whole. And 
when we get to the bottom of it, it's a trauma epidemic. And that anything that we can do to both, you know, put the bandages on the bleeding that's happening, that's, you know, doing so much harm. And at the same time, looking at these, this, these deeper issues that so many wonderful researchers, theoreticians, speakers, clinicians have, have seen that right. if we, we can make some headway into helping people to develop skills like mindfulness skills, ethical mindfulness skills, and give them trauma resolution opportunities, that that's going to be how the ship fully turns around. Right. My hope is that this summit and others like it can help people to really engage in this dialogue in a way that helps to end some suffering. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you know, there'll be a number of uh, different audiences that are listening to and watching these, these interviews. And certainly people who are working in the field will be part of that audience. And I can't even tell you how excited I am about the different people that I've talked to. I mean, there's yeah. some amazing work that's going on. And, you know, whether it's, you know, I was talking to someone at the North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition who works with the police and different agencies and how they're really changing. And they've, they've given up on the war on drugs. They're not doing that anymore. Uh -huh. And they're really changing what the approach that they have at a really holistic core level. And so, and all of the different people that are, you know, someone's doing an arts program. There's just so many exciting things that are going on. And to have a recovery center and more than one now that are, are working trauma first and, and mindfulness based. And it's really, it's really exciting to see all of that start to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Cool. Well, That's thank you fun. very much for being part of this. This has been really fun to talk with you. And I'm glad we got your voice into this. Go to killabycenter.com, Radical Recovery Summit, to see the full schedule of speakers and to register to watch these free online September 23rd and 24th in the Radical Recovery Summit 2017.